we are going to be studying Parasha Tetzaveh from Exodus 27, verse 20 through chapter 30, verse 10. And Tetzaveh is Hebrew for you command, and it's the 20th weekly Torah portion. And it reports of God's command to bring olive oil for the lamp, the menorah, and make sacred garments for the priests, and to conduct an ordination ceremony to, for the priests, and to make an incense altar. Altogether, this parasha of Tetzaveh contains seven new mitzvot commandments that we will learn today, and I'll share more in detail later. As I've mentioned in the video teaching for this parasha, there is also a lot of symbolic detail within the Mikdash tabernacle that reveals the plan for man's sanctification and salvation, as well as in the hidden message in the beaten olives to produce the olive oil for the menorah and the armor of God seen in the garments of the high priest. But first off, it's interesting to note that just as God's name was not mentioned in the Megillah of Esther, so too this Torah portion that we're reading today is the only Torah parsha that does not mention the name of Moshe. And this is due to Moshe's plea to Hashem to rather than eradicate Israel, he says, erase me now from your book. Your book in Hebrew is Sefercha. And Sefercha can be broken down to two words. Sefer, which is a scroll or a book, and Kaf, the letter Kaf, which is got a gematria of 20, as Ka is the suffix meaning your in a Hebrew word. And it is got the numerical value of 20, thus also meaning the 20th book. Thus Moses was removed from this 20th parasha or portion of the Torah, called Tetzaveh, the 20th portion of the Torah. And this is why God, instead of saying the word of the Lord came to Moses, and Moses should tell the children of Israel, it just says, you, in the place of Moses, command the children of Israel. The Baal Haturim writes that Moses' name is not mentioned in this entire parsha, so that his selfless request to Hashem to erase him from this 20th portion would be fulfilled in some respect. Therefore, the opening verse of our parsha in Exodus 27 verse 20 does not refer to him by name, but simply as you, which is Ata in Hebrew. They ata tetseva et bene Israel, and you shall command the children of Israel. Ve yiku elecha shemen zayit zakaitit la maor, that they bring unto you pure olive oil beaten for the light. Leha olaut ner tamid, to cause the lamp to burn continually. Here we see the word tetzeva, meaning command, in the opening verse of our parsha. However, tetzeva is also a derivative of the word saba, as in the word mitzvah, meaning connection, as the mitzvahs help us connect to Hashem. And Rabbi Menachem Mendel says that according to this translation, the verse could also read, and you should connect the people of Israel which hints to the fact that Moshe connects the people of Israel with God through the mitzvot. Thus, commandment-keeping is so beautiful when we look at it this way. It connects us to Hashem and connects us to each other. Interestingly, when Moshe succeeds in this task of connecting the people to Hashem, he actually becomes more spiritually strengthened himself. For as a true Jewish leader, his entire essence and being is bound up with the people so that when the people increased their connection to God, it makes Moshe stronger. This is hinted, too, at the end of the verse. They should bring to you pure olive oil. In other words, when Moshe connects the descendants of Israel to God, Moshe's own spiritual light grows stronger. And so does ours today, when we join Moshe in this great commission to reconnect the people of Israel 
to God by helping them return to a knowledge of Torah and the mitzvot. The verse continues saying that the olives must be crushed for lighting. In other words, when the Jewish people are crushed, especially through exile, there's always a Jewish leader of the caliber of Moshe to be found. And this is referred to in the Zohar as well as the extension of Moshe in every generation. This leader can take a people who are spiritually crushed and transform them to be ready for lighting and for being a light to the nations, spiritually awake and illuminated, and then helping them to illuminate others. Then the people of Israel can reach the level indicated by the end of the verse to ignite the lamp until it burns continually. And this is our goal, to burn continually. In other words, that they may become spiritually self-sufficient to the extent that they no longer need or are dependent upon their leader and that they can burn continually without his direct input. These are a few beautiful insights just from the opening verse of our parsha this morning. But then our parsha goes in to more depth on the lighting of the menorah in the temple. In the tent of meeting outside the current uh, curtain veil, which is before the testimony, Aaron and his sons are to set it in order to burn from evening to morning before Adonai. It will be a statue forever throughout their generations on behalf of B'nai Israel. we read. The word tetzava, meaning to command, here also means to connect, as in to bond. Thus the verse can also be read as God saying to Moshe, and you shall bond with the children of Israel which is what we're experiencing here at the Assembly of Called Out Believers, such a beautiful bonding as we reunite both houses of Israel back together, Christians and Jews loving on each other, appreciating each other, and learning from each other, and ultimately unifying in this bonding with Hashem. And this is the model that we are seeking to follow as well, bonding with the children of Israel, and helping to bond Israel back to Judah as we facilitate their bonding back to Hashem and his ways in Torah. Moshe was given a charge of authority from the Almighty to take control over the children of Israel and to instruct them in regards to the requirements of bringing only pure olive oil for the menorah. The menorah was to burn before Hashem from evening until morning every day without exception. Great care was given in gathering the oil fruit from the tree. In order not to injure the crop or the tree, it was gathered either by hand or by shaking the fruit off carefully with a light stick. It was only the third crop of the harvest on the inner branches which was used for the menorah oil because it had ripened slowly and it had no dross in it. As dust can sometimes fall on the fruit of the outside of the tree, the inner tree was preserved and clean and pure. It was carefully cleansed and carried to a press, which was considered the best method of obtaining oil from the fruit. In order to make the oil, the fruit was processed by hand pressing each olive gently until only one drop of pure oil emerged. The olive oil used in the tent of meeting for the menorah had to be free of all sediment in this way. The menorah was only lit once a day, and this was in the afternoon, at the same time as the evening sacrifice in the outer court. The word tamid here, which means continually, is used in Exodus 29, verse 42, as well as Numbers 28, verse 6, regarding the daily sacrifice. And we see this mentioned in the book of Daniel as well. In Exodus 25, verse 30, the word also used for the bread placed before the eternal once a week was continual or tamid as well. The seven lampstands were cleansed in the morning and the new oil was poured in the afternoon. It was calculated how much oil was needed by um, for the menorah to burn throughout the longest night of the year. 
The same amount of oil was used all year round, which meant that the lamps burned even after sunrise on the shorter nights of the year. The longest night in Jerusalem is approximately 14 hours long, and the shortest is approximately 10 hours long. If the illumination from the menorah was to reflect the Almighty's image, it would therefore be appropriate that anyone or anything that was to be used in his presence should reflect his holiness. Thus, pure oil from the olive symbolized the Ruach HaKodesh, the Spirit of the Almighty. And the burning of this oil in the menorah would shine forth the Almighty's marvelous light throughout the holy place. This is a picture of the pure oil of the Spirit shining forth through his anointed corporate vessels, his witnesses upon the earth, his people, B'nai Israel, his holy nation, this kingdom of priests. Until now, Hashem had spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and tell them what says the Almighty. But here, Hashem tells Moshe, Now you shall command the children of Israel that they shall take for you pure olive oil, pressed for illumination, to kindle the lamp continually, this is the only example in the Bible with Moshe being told by Hashem to command the children of Israel. Each of the other examples found in the Tanakh shows that Hashem spoke to Moshe to speak to the children of Israel. Moshe now takes on the duty of a more pastoral care for the children of Israel, and it is of importance for his leaders to understand that their charge is to ensure that there is a daily supply of oil in each vessel by feeding the flock and teaching obedience to the Almighty's written word in Torah. The word rabbi means teacher, but the word pastor has more of a shepherd uh, connotation. And so many true leaders will have both a rabbi teaching role as well as a shepherding, nurturing, caretaking role of the flock. The Almighty says <clears throat> through Rabbi Shaul that he might present his people to himself a glorious assembly, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. In Ephesians 5.27, Moshe had placed the children of Israel's well-being before his very own life. It was Moshe's duty to guide and instruct the children of Israel and to present them before the Holy One without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. Likewise, the Holy One had committed himself to the children of Israel through his promises, and Moshe exemplified here a type of groomsman pastor, as it is the job of a groomsman pastor to keep the bride chaste and without blemish. Shaul also says in Ephesians 4, 11, And he gave some to be apostles, and some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors, and some to be teachers, for the perfecting of the holy ones. This gets translated as saints. Basically, his bride is to be perfected in holiness, without spot or blemish, for the work of the ministry, and for the edifying, the building up of the body of Messiah. So this is the true model of what is being established today, and yet we see first established in Moshe, and then even greater through Yeshua, who was the prophet like unto Moshe. The children of Israel, metaphorically speaking, are likened to virgins. You could not separate the two groups in the parable as they were identical. Remember the parable in Matthew 25. Each one was significant, but all were virgins. Each of the ten were identified as a virgin, and each of the ten had all come together for the same purpose. The ten virgins were all, were for all intent and purposes identical in their appearance. However, there was one significant difference, with that difference being that five of them did not have enough oil in their lamps. And that is likened to not having enough Torah. And the only reason one would not have enough Torah is through disobedience or rebellion. 
Remember what David said, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. They all knew that some day, sooner than later, the bridegroom was coming. All of the children of Israel were required to have a daily supply of oil with which to keep the menorah lit in the temple. Five of the virgins decided to be obedient and equip themselves with the prescribed daily supply of extra virgin olive oil for their lamps, while the other five, for one reason or another, did nothing to prepare. Perhaps they were too involved with the cares of this world and forgot to prepare for the world to come, or just maybe it was not expedient to be diligent each day, or that they just did not simply care. But for one reason or another, they did not prepare themselves to provide the daily oil which was needed for the menorah to burn in the presence of the Almighty. The oil for the temple was never to be sold, but it was something that each person was to prepare and contribute. The olives were provided from vineyards that were set aside for the purpose of this provision for the temple. It was not a requirement to pay for the olives to prepare the oil, but it was necessary for your heart to be submitted to this labor towards the daily task. We must put in the daily preparation each day to ensure that our lives are illuminated by His Spirit of Truth through our writing His Word upon our hearts. In the preparation of the oil, the olive gives its yield only when it is pounded or squeezed, and so the light of His presence will only come forth from us when the flesh has been broken and crushed. Then the oil of His Spirit will ooze out and become that which can be ignited and used to shine forth His glory. In this process, our egos and rebellious natures, our own hearts and our own eyes are crushed into pulp and needing, needed to be discarded, leaving the, only the Ruach HaKodesh within to shine forth through the broken clay vessel. Our perspective is short-sighted during our trials, not seeing the value of the glory of His presence, which will be revealed through our crushed flesh. The children of Israel were to walk in this marvelous light of truth and salvation. Nothing was to be hid from them. The word of the Almighty was not for private interpretation, but for all Israel's ears to hear. If we were to rehearse his word daily in our lives and were to allow his ways to become our ways at all seasons, we indeed could walk in that marvelous light and be a light for all the world. A spiritual city, as it is said, that sits high upon a hill for all to see. Matthew 6.22 says, The light of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye be single, your whole body shall be full of light. That means have a singular focus on Hashem. But if your eye be evil, your whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you be darkened, how great is that darkness. And Paul said in Ephesians 4, 6, 13, But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever does make manifest is light. In thinking and meditating upon this menorah and this oil, we realize it's only the first four verses of our parasha, but there's so much depth for us to take to heart as God has designed for us in knowing our true identity in Israel to fulfill our divine purpose in being lights to the nations. And the only way we can do this is by daily putting on the armor of God, which is the priestly robes, as our identity doesn't simply remain in Israel in general, but as a kingdom of priests that Yeshua renewed the covenant for. And in chapter 28, this is why understanding the light first then leads to the priestly garments. And this is the main theme of this week's parasha, which deals almost entirely with the selection of the Korean priests, the garments they wore, and the inaugural service by which they and their offspring would become confirmed for all time as special ministers of Yah. 
God's people must put on the priestly armor of God, which is symbolic spiritually, in order to intercede on behalf of all Israel and engage in spiritual warfare with them and on their behalf. So let's talk a little bit about these garments of the high priest mentioned in chapter 28. The Almighty starts off by telling Moshe to make expensive clothing for the Kohen. This he was told to do before Aharon or his sons were allowed to present themselves before him. Looking at the materials used in the clothes of the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, we see richness and finery far beyond what the average person would wear. The vestments were made of gold and precious jewels, as well as the finest possible cloth. Additionally, because the blue in his vestment looks like the blue in the sky called the helot, a connection is established between him and the heavenly throne of God. Everything in the garments had a spiritual significance. None of the priests were fit to serve in the temple unless he was wearing the sacred garments. These garments are essential in order for the priests to function in their sacred capacity, so much that in their absence, the offerings made by the priests in the temple had no validity. The Talmud states, while they are clothed in the priestly garments, they are clothed in the priesthood. But when they are not wearing the garments, the priesthood is not upon them. The garments elevated them to the high levels of sanctity and holiness required from them and required for all who would come to serve before God in the holy place. After the sin of Adam and Eve in Gan Eden, the Creator clothed them, and Adam was given a special garment. And in this week's Torah portion, Moshe is commanded to clothe Aharon and his sons in not just anything he designed, but as the Creator instructed in the finest clothing available, wearing fine ornate jewelry and being cleansed and even perfumed in the prescribed manner. How much more should we apply these things to our physical and spiritual walks before presenting ourselves to the Lord. A picture is being painted here for us in that we are not to come to him without blood sacrifice as well as the cleansing and the anointing of the Spirit and our priestly vestments, which should be beautifully ornate, representing the spiritual garments and character which he has given us. Character and garments are always a prophetic symbol of each other in Bible prophecy. And holy garments to perform his service are what are essential, and not doing it in our own garments or our own way, our own energies, our own capabilities. Despite the splendor and the beauty of these priestly robes, though, it is important to note that it still took the washing of water and the blood of the Corban offering and the oil representing the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, to make Aharon acceptable before the Holy One of Israel. And this is a message for us, as only our cleansing by the washing of the Word, along with the sacrifice of the spotless Lamb of God, can consecrate us in being a kingdom of priests in conjunction with the Spirit of Truth, who is leading us in all truth and enabling us to live in holiness and serve before Hashem as we see in type with the Aaronic priesthood. In chapter 28, verse 6, it speaks of the ephod, and it says, And they shall make the ephod of gold, thread, blue, purple, and scarlet wool, and fine twisted linen, artistic work. The ephod resembled an apron worn backwards, so that it covered the back of the wearer from above the waist down to the ankles and overlapped in the front. A sash tied in the front beneath the heart, and two bands extended up to the wearer's back to his shoulders. On the ends of these bands, which rested on the shoulders of the wearer, God tells Moshe to place two shoham, which are something like onyx stones, in gold settings. The stones should be engraved with the names of the twelve tribes of Israel's six names on one shoulder, on one stone, 
and six names on the other stone, on the other shoulder, according to their birth order. Thus, as God's representative, he carried Israel upon his shoulders when he went before the Almighty in the heavenly tabernacle. When Aharon was clad in the blue ephod robe, he was carrying out a prophetic action which showed that the Messiah would rise through the heavens after the resurrection. Isaiah 53.11 says, He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By the knowledge of himself shall my righteous servant justify many, and he shall bear their iniquities. Back in our Torah portion, in verse 12, just as the high priest bore the names of the twelve tribes of Israel on his shoulders, as well as having them engraved upon the stones which were upon his heart, our high priest and Messiah has had his people upon his heart as a remembrance, and he upholds them with his strength and carries them to their eternal destination. There is a statement that is said by Tiller, when a shepherd rescues a lamb, he carries it upon his shoulder. So the infinite strength of Messiah is capable of bearing each of us until we reach heaven's fold. Therefore, he is able to save to the utmost those who draw near to God through him, seeing that he ever lives to make intercession for us as Rabbi Shaul said in Hebrews 7.25. Also in Hebrews 9, verse 24, he tells us that Yeshua has entered into heaven itself on our behalf, into that heavenly tabernacle, of which the earthly tabernacle and all its procedures was a representation. And it is there that he makes intercession for us. Since Messiah carries the name of the children of Israel on his shoulders, there is a constant memorial before the Father of his death for all of us. The fifty days correspond with the fifty letters of the names of Israel's sons that are on the Messiah's shoulders. In regard to the breastplate, Hurt says that the stones on his heart are Aaron's silent prayer to God on behalf of his entire people. Tiller suggests that the Messiah continually bears our names as he ministers in the presence of God for us. The whole ministry of the high priest Aaron, which also includes his clothes, speaks of the ministry that Messiah ben Yosef has from the time of his resurrection until this day. This is the reason that the Torah goes into all the detail of the clothing of the high priest. Now, Aaron's head was over the blue robe, and his body, of course, was under. In the same way, the Messiah, who is the head of his body, sits above the heavens in his high priestly ministry of intercession for Israel, while his body ministers upon the earth. The Messiah's ministry, according to the order of Melchizedek, was also given to this order and followed by his Talmudim disciples. Fifty days after his resurrection on Shavuot, when the Spirit was poured out, as we see in Acts chapter 2. And this brings us to the breastplate, mentioned in verse 22 of our parasha, chapter 28. This is called a Hoshin in Hebrew, and it was a beautiful breastplate of judgment with the twelve stones, each stone representing a different tribe of Israel over Aaron's heart, decorated and surrounded by gold. A rectangular piece of fabric, woven of the same materials as the ephod, would be folded in half to make a square pouch measuring half a cubit by half a cubit, approximately ten inches by ten inches. Upon its front, in gold settings, the twelve gemstones would be arranged in four rows. According to the Midrash in Bamidbar Rabbah 2.7, the colorings of the stones were as follows. Reuben's stone was called Odin, and it was red. Simeon's stone, Petida, was green. Levi's stone, Baraket, was white. 
black, and red. Judah stone, called nofek in Hebrew, was sky-colored. And this might be because of the tehelet color of sapphire stone, which is God's footstool from which the Ten Commandments were taken and written with God's own finger, since Judah preserved the commandments and the Torah. His color was the same tehelet that we wear also in our tzitzit to remember the commandments. Issachar stone, called sapir, was dark blue, and Zebulun stone, yahalom, was white, which we call lavan in Hebrew, which can also sometimes have a transparency to it, like a milkiness, like a clear white. Dawn stone, Lashem, was of a similar hue to that of Sapir. God stone, Shivo, was gray, and Naphtali stone, Atlama, was the color of clear wine. Asher stone, Tarshish, was the color of the precious stone with which women decorate themselves, it is recorded. And Yosef stone, Shoham, was black. Binyamin stone, Yespe, had the color of all twelve stones incorporated in it. In addition to the names of the tribes, the stones also contain the words Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, Shifte, Yeshuran, the righteous tribes of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So the breastplate should contain all twenty-two letters of the holy tongue incorporated into it. And Rashi says that it is called breastplate of judgment because it confirms the message given by the Urim and Tumen, as recorded in Numbers 27, verse 21. In our Torah portion, we find it in chapter 28, verse 30, the mention of the Urim and the Tumim. He says, you shall put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Tumim, and they shall be on Aharon's heart when he goes in before the Almighty. And Aharon shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel on his heart before Hashem continually. The Hebrew word Urim, the plural of Ur, means flames, like flames of light. And the Hebrew word Tumim, the plural of Tom, means fulfillments or completions. Thus the Talmud in Yalma 73b says, Why were they called Urim and Tumim? Urim because they caused the words to light up, and Tumim because the words were fulfilled. According to Rashi, Urim de Tumim is the name of a piece of parchment where the Almighty's holy name was written. The parchment was placed inside the double-layered breastplate, and it caused the letters to light up and be fulfilled when they gave important information about things concerning the nation of Israel, or when questions were asked to the Lord. It's beautiful to think of the Lord's holy name being the source of that light underneath the Urim and Tumim. Usually translated as lightings and perfections, since the message shone forth and was then perfected by the high priest. The Urim and Tumim would be consulted like an oracle. The high priest would meditate on the stones until he reached a level of divine inspiration. He would see the breastplate with inspired vision, and the letters containing the answer would appear to light up or stand out. With his divine inspiration, the high priest would then be able to combine the letters to spell out the answer. Josephus writes that when the Israelites went to battle, the stones would also shine forth with great splendor as a sign of victory. And you can read about that in Antiquities 3, verse 8 and 9. The Urim and Tumim, therefore, represent the will of the Eternal One. Urim, light, reveals his will. Tumim, fulfillments, enables man to fulfill his will. In the Melchizedek priesthood, which Yeshua established for today, Urim and Tumim are within the heart of the priest. His only longing is for the will of the Eternal to be fulfilled. His priests today have the choice of the Spirit in their inner man 
to light the way and give them direction in the specifics of life, as the Urim and Tumim in their heart is represented. This inner guidance can come through meditation or by a divine witness of the Spirit, and even as an audible voice at times. Therefore, as priests subject to his guidance, we wait upon him for his direction in the affairs of this life. His presence can be manifest when his people follow the divine pattern and walk in fellowship and holiness with him. In verse 36, we see mention of the zitz. He says, You shall make a headplate of pure gold, and you shall engrave upon it, engraved like a signet ring, holy to Yahavah. In Hebrew, this is kadosh le Yahavah. And what's amazing to think about this parchment that is over the high priest's heart with the holy name that lights up the room and tomb, you also have the name of the Holy One upon the forehead. This is the true sign and seal of God's people, because a name connotates character, and Yahweh's character is selfless love. And so it is what is written upon our hearts and upon our minds, as Torah is written upon our hearts and upon our minds. The Tzitz <clears throat> was a band which the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, wore across his forehead like a gold crown over his turban. Engraved into this band and pressed in from the back so as to appear in relief, coming out from the band were the words Kadosh Le Yahavah, interpreted holiness or holy to the Lord. He wore it affixed to his forehead by a single blue strap, also the color of Tehelet that is in our Zitzit representing commandment-keeping. By bearing the name of God upon his head, the high priest was symbolically invested with the authority of that holy name. Like a king's servant who bears the signet ring of the king, the high priest was God's official agent on earth. In verse 37, it says, Attached to the engraved gold crown ornament with a, a tahelet cord, to the turban, on the front of the turban. The next verse tells us why. It will rest on Avron's forehead so that Aaron will bear away the iniquity committed regarding the holy things which B'nai Israel set apart as all their holy gifts. It is to be always on his forehead so that they may have favor before Adonai. And verse 39 says, you are to weave the tunic in a checkered work of fine linen and make a turban of fine linen and make a sash the work of a color weaver. Exodus 29 verse 6 also mentions the turban, saying, Set the turban on his head and put the holy crown on the turban. All the priests were to wear linen head coverings as a sign of submission to the Holy One of Israel. Even a student in ancient times would always wear a little linen cap representing his learning. And the Talmud teaches us to cover our head in reverence of heaven. It says that the reverence of heaven be upon you. And the practice of not going about bareheaded at any time has become a mark of Jewish piety. Initially, priests who served before the Almighty in the tent of meeting would later serve in the first as well as the second temples. It had always been the hope of Hashem that the children of Israel would be to him a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, which is being fulfilled in us through the new covenant, or the renewed covenant, that Yeshua established. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, Peter records in 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. In chapter 29, we see the consecration of Aharon as the high priest and the other priest 
as well as the sacrifices that were to be made on their behalf. And I won't spend much time on this this morning, as I've shared aspects of this in the videos, and the deep symbolism with the anointing oil and the sprinkling being the same that is used to heal one who is afflicted with Zara'at from thinking and speaking negative about a fellow man, and how Aharon had to be prepared to have no negative thoughts towards the children of Israel in order to intercede on their behalf before the Lord according to the priestly model we see in our high priest Yeshua. And so must we as a kingdom of priests have no negativity and be a part of no divisiveness within the whole house of Israel, but seeking to intercede and atone for one another, to cover one another's sins, and to bring each other closer together. This is the model of our priesthood that we see exemplified by the very consecration and anointing upon the priest that would actually take away all negativity from their minds for one another. Interestingly, the Hebrew term for sacrifices, korbanot, is related to the word kiruv, meaning close. And this suggests that the process of bringing sacrifices in the temple brought man closer to his creator and closer to his fellow man. Ironically, however, the word close itself suggests a certain distance. For if two entities are merely close to one another, they remain in the final analysis still separate. It is only that despite their inherent separateness, they have come close together and closer together through this process. Incense, which is called ketoret in Hebrew, suggests connecting as well. Here we are not speaking of two separate entities which have become closer, but rather two entities that have actually become echad, one. And this is the process of God showing us how we're not only to be brought closer together and closer to him, but actually become one. And this is why the incense is mentioned lastly. Thus the offering of the incense in the holy temple was a process by which man and God, who had already become close through the offering of sacrifices, were then to be joined together in total akkad oneness, symbolized by the different parts of the incense becoming one as they ascend before Hashem in holiness. In order to stress this point, the command to build the incense altar was recorded here, when you would have thought it would have been recorded in last week's parasha, as God began with the most holy place and then described the furniture of the holy place next. But the altar of incense was purposely left to this final place so that we could realize that oneness is the ultimate goal. For the tabernacle had been erected and the priests were inaugurated in God's presence. Nevertheless, God was only close to B'nai Israel, but not yet one with them, at least in a revealed manner, until the incense was offered. The last ten verses of Tetzaveh describe the golden altar of incense, saying, And you shall make an altar for the burning of incense. Of shittim wood shall you make it. A cubit shall be the length of it, and a cubit its breadth. Four square shall it be, and two cubits shall be its height. The horns thereof shall be of the same, and you shall overlay it with pure gold, its top and its sides round about, and its horns, and you shall make for it a rim of gold. So it even had a crown around it, which is sometimes translated as a rim, which we mentioned last week, which one of three pieces of furniture that had a crown, the Ark of the Covenant, the altar of incense, and the table of showbread. Like the other vessels, the golden altar should have rings and carrying poles to transport it. It should be placed in the center of the outer chamber of the sanctuary, right in front of the veil that is by the Ark of the Testimony. The golden altar should be used only for the twice-daily burning of the Ketret incense. So just like the menorah was tended to twice a day, the incense is also dealt with twice a day at the same time as the morning and the evening sacrifice. 
And Aaron shall burn upon it sweet incense every morning when he dresses the lamps. He shall burn incense on it. And when Aharon lights the lamps at evening, he shall burn incense upon it, a perpetual incense before God throughout your generations. Once a day, each year, however, the golden altar served an additional function. On Yom Kippur, the high priest sprinkled the blood of the day's special offerings on its horns. Once in the year shall he make atonement upon it throughout your generations, the Torah tells us. It is most holy to Hashem. The Levites served in the courtyard, and if one views the setup of the tabernacle in a vertical fashion, with the Holy of Holies being at the top, it can be said that the Levites were below the incense altar. Thus the souls of men corresponding to the teaching level of the Levites are also under the altar. Consider that the souls of the saints in the book of Revelation, whose prayers are mixed with incense, are seen as located under the altar also. The only way to interpret Revelation is by understanding Torah and the book of Daniel. These two things are the clues for that book which was sealed up for the last 2,000 years. The incense altar, centered in front of the veil, was where the priestly man could approach the Almighty and begin to enter into communion with him by means of the incense which would arise and form a link between man below and God above. Our prayers ascend as incense, as a fragrant aroma before the Lord, linking us to him in constant communication. As Rabbi Shaul says, pray without ceasing, be in constant connection and communication with him. And in fact, our communication is the connection that we are to keep continually with him. The Almighty said to Moshe, for the construction of the incense altar, you shall overlay it with pure gold, the top of it, the sides of it around it, and its horns, and you shall make a gold molding around it. This is in chapter 30, verse 3. You shall put it before the veil that is by the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony, where I will meet with you. So this is the special meeting place where we get connected. Aharon, in verse 8 it says, shall burn the incense of sweet spices on it every morning. When he tends the lamps, he shall burn it. And also, when Aaron lights the lamps at evening, he shall burn it. A perpetual incense before the Almighty throughout your generations. In the scriptures, incense represents knowledge. As it is written in 2 Corinthians 2, 14 and 15, now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Messiah and reveals through us the sweet aroma incense of his knowledge in every place. For we are a sweet aroma of Messiah to God in those who are saved and those who perish. Thus the burning of incense each morning and each evening symbolizes praying with understanding. Revelations 5, verse 8, and 8, verse 3, connotates the sacrifices and the incense. As the sacrifices offered on the brass altar symbolize prayer in the Spirit, this teaches us that the importance of praying both with the Spirit and with understanding every morning and every noon, is, or every afternoon, at the time of the evening sacrifice, is essential for our spiritual growth. This is why I always promote to everyone to uh, arrange your daily schedule so that you can go through a time of prayer and meditation at 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. This is the reason for the practice of praying morning and evening at the time when the morning and evening sacrifices were offered in the temple. These are our priestly offerings unto the Lord. May our prayers ascend as a fragrant aroma and be found holy and acceptable in connecting us to the Holy One, blessed be He. Altogether, in this parasha of Tetzaveh, we find seven new mitzvot commandments, comprised of four positive commandments and three prohibitions. 
which I will now point out with a little expounding upon how they can relate to us today, even without the tabernacle or temple in place. In chapter 27, verse 20, we get the mitzvah that priests are instructed to prepare the lamps of the menorah. It is our job to take care of the light. The menorah, as we see in Revelation, is a symbol of the assembly of God's people, the body of Messiah. He's the ultimate light, showing us how to be lights. He's the living Torah, showing us how to be living Torahs. And it is our job as a kingdom of priests to take care of this assembly and to help it shine forth brightly to the nations. And we can draw a correlation today in that we should prepare our lamps with our Torah studies and the Spirit of Truth. As I mentioned in Psalms 119, verse 105, it says, Thy word is the lamp unto my feet, and the light unto my path. The second mitzvah commandment in this parasha is found in chapter 28, verse 4, where we derive the commandment that the priest should wear special garments. And we should not only put on the armor of God daily, but Jewish men also wear the kippah, on our heads to remind ourselves that we are a kingdom of priests and we are to be a kingdom of priests in the messianic age. And so many of the things that we do as Jews are done to keep in practice the order of the priesthood, such as washing of the hands. There was a laver outside of the holy place so that before one entered it, they were cleansed and even the priest would cleanse themselves. This is the reason why we wash our hands and say a blessing over the hand washing, the same way with wearing a kippah, because the priests were commanded to wear a linen head covering. And so there's many things that the world does not understand, but we're doing, looking forward to the temple rebuilt by Mashiach and officiating as a kingdom of priests. In chapter 28, verse 28, we get our third mitzvah, that the breastplate should not become detached from the ephod apron. The breastplate symbolizes righteousness when we put on the armor of God daily. And this mitzvah symbolizes that righteousness should not be separate from our work, as an apron would be something that one would put on to officiate in their work. And we should not become detached from our identity in Israel, as the twelve stones of the ephod represent each tribe. Also, it's interesting to note that it says that the two sets of rings on each side were tied together with a length of sky blue wool string so that the breastplate would remain firmly in place. And this represents the same thing that the blue in our tzitzit represents, which is the commandments, which are what connect us to Hashem and to each other and keep us firmly in place on this spiritual way or journey or path. In chapter 28, verse 32, we get the mitzvah not to tear the opening for the head in the robe of the priestly garment. So it was purposely sewn in such a way that the neck of the robe was doubly reinforced by folding the material inward to provide a double layer of strength. This rending is a striking expression of grief or anger at the loss of a loved one, we call a kriya in Hebrew. When we have someone that is close to us that dies, we often mourn and tear a portion of our garment near the neckline. And God told his priest not to ever tear the opening for the head in the robe. A priest has to be above emotional outbursts. And Aaron was told not to even grieve when his sons died. Remember Nadav and Avihu? This is because one may have the tendency to blame Hashem for the death instead of understanding the cause and effect of sin, which is the true cause of death. And as a kingdom of priests, we need to rise above our emotions and to be of sound mind following Yah's commandments, leading us in a life of selfless service, exemplifying his selfless love. 
In chapter 29, verse 33, we get our fifth mitzvah, to eat the flesh of the sin offering and the guilt offering. This was not to imply atonement from sin, but rather refers to leaving behind an inferior spiritual status and moving up to a higher one. God does not design that we remain where we were at as children. We are called to live up to the light he gives us so that he can give us new light and we can reach a higher status day by day through our sanctifying process. The priests who eat of the offerings to the Lord are thus consecrated with the offering by performing the mitzvah of eating their portion of the offering. And in chapter 30, verse 7, we get our sixth mitzvah, which is about the burning of the incense. Every morning and evening, as we discussed, the incense of the spices should go up in smoke before the Lord as a fragrant offering just as our prayers are said morning and evening. And we should remember the great importance of this practice, as it's not only a commandment, but it further connects us to our Creator. And the seventh and last mitzvah in this parasha is found in chapter 30, verse 9, not to burn foreign incense or offer up sacrifices on the golden altar, altar of incense. And this teaches us that we should only pray the way God has taught our forefathers to pray. You know, offering up alien incense, foreign incense, that represents prayers, is like learning to pray the way pagans pray, with useless babblings or in other uh, wrong elements. We are not to dabble in the things influenced by false religions and foreign sources, so it would be a good practice for each one to actually learn how the Jewish people have been taught to pray and have preserved the prayer liturgy in the place of the sacrificial system since the temple has been destroyed. Hashem has revealed to us that the Ketoret incense burning is the most beloved of all offerings by leaving it for last. All the other korbanot atone for transgressions, but the ketoret is offered purely to bring joy and happiness and unity, symbolizing the bliss that comes from complete unity with the Creator. Even after the Mishkan and all its holy vessels were completed, after the Shulchan table and the menorah were set up in their positions and the korbanot slaughtered, the Shekinah still did not descend. It was only when this Ketoret incense was offered that the Shekinah finally came down to reside in the Mishkan Tabernacle. This, in closing, reveals to us how important our constant communication and connection with Hashem is, as the altar of incense represents our intimate prayer life, connecting us with Him and unifying us with His holiness. With this inspiration, May each of you be blessed with a deeper and more intimate communication as you meditate upon the depth of importance in this beautiful symbolism today, all culminating in the final description of the incense ascending as a fragrant aroma before the Lord. May our lives of selfless love and holiness so connect us with Him that we too are a sweet incense before the Lord, exuding that sweet fragrance of Messiah in all that we do. Amen. So now I'd like to open it up for your questions and comments and to Midrash about this parasha of Tetzaveh and its focus on how to connect or bond us as priests to the Holy One. <laughs> 